We're going to continue now with our study of eschatology, and I mentioned in our first session that we are experiencing a crisis of eschatology with specific reference to the attacks that have been launched against the credibility of the Scriptures and also of the credibility of Jesus' prophecies concerning His own return. And I mentioned then, as I'll mention again, that I'm following the basic structure of my book entitled, The Last Days According to Jesus. And I'll warn you again that the position that I'll take on these matters may seem uh, different from what you may uh, commonly hear on these subjects. But before we get to uh, my views and that sort of thing, I think it's important that we do a little historical reconnaissance of the critical theories that have come to uh, the forefront in the last uh, two centuries. The 19th century, in the field of theology, as well as in other academic disciplines, was dominated by theories of evolution. Now, we tend to think of evolution strictly in biological terms, but the uh, theoretical thought of the 19th century was strongly influenced by the philosophy of Frederick Hegel, who had an evolutionary view of all of history, not just of, uh, of, of biological developments among living species and so on, but all of the dynamic of history was cast against this backdrop of progressive evolution. And this was applied by scholars in the 19th century to the developments of religion. And the school that came out of this was called the uh, Religious Historical School. The Religious Historical School was a school of thought that dominated liberal theology in the 19th century that applied these principles of evolution to biblical religion, saying that biblical religion follows the same basic pattern that all religions follow in their historic development, that religion begins in a simple manner and then develops to a more complex viewpoint. It begins in animism with a view that uh, uh, supposedly inanimate objects are inhabited by spirits, usually evil spirits, and then you develop from that into uh, polytheism and henotheism, and finally, in a later time in history, you see the emergence of full-orbed monotheism. And the arguments, of course, were that biblical religion followed the same pattern of development. Now, hand in hand with the religious historical schools, application of evolutionary principles to the development of, bil of biblical religion was a powerful anti-supernatural bent that controlled the analysis of the content of the Scriptures. So that anything that communicated miracle was rejected out of hand. Anything supernatural, such as the virgin birth of Jesus, uh, the atonement as a cosmic event of reconciliation between the human and the divine, the resurrection, the ascension, and obviously the return of Jesus at the end of the age was also considered part of the mythological trappings that were included in the biblical documents. So, uh, this produced a crisis in the church in the 19th century, particularly in Europe, because you had thousands of uh, men who had been ordained into the Christian ministry and millions and millions of dollars invested in church buildings and in church programs, and all of a sudden the theologians are saying, uh, this is all a myth. Uh, so what do we do? Close the churches? Cause all these preachers to be unemployed? Or do we revise the, our understanding uh, 
of Christianity in such a way as to make it compatible with modern theories of man and the world. Well, again, 19th century liberalism obviously chose the latter course and tried to reduce the significance of the teaching of the New Testament and the ministry of Jesus to a this-worldly concern for social and humanitarian issues. That the kingdom of God, which was the motif that the biblical scholars understood that unified the Old and the New Testaments, that that central concept of the kingdom of God, which is announced as coming as at the beginning pages of the New Testament with the advent of John the Baptist who called the people to repentance because the kingdom of God was at hand, that these scholars sought to redefine the meaning of the kingdom of God in terms of ethics and values. One of the leading thinkers of the 19th century in this regard was a man by the name of Albrecht Ritschel, a German scholar who argued that the teaching of Jesus must be understood not in supernatural terms of personal salvation, but rather in terms of the teaching of important human values, and that the kingdom of God has to do with social applications of the ethical teaching of Jesus so that people will begin to show love one to another, to care for the poor, and so on, which then gave uh, impetus later to Rauschenbusch's development of the so-called social gospel. And we know that ever since that time there's been this, this uh, cleavage between so-called liberalism and conservatism over whether or not the basic mission of the church is simply to minister to the needs of human beings in this world, in this time, or whether one of the great needs of human beings is personal redemption uh, and reconciliation to God. Uh, when I was a student in seminary, I studied theology for a while under Dietrich Ritschel, who was the grandson of Albrecht Ritschel, the German theologian of whom I've just mentioned. But in any case, following this uh, development of 19th century uh, liberalism, <coughs> a book appeared early in the 20th century that uh, made a tremendous uh, impact on the whole field of biblical scholarship. And it was written by a very famous man, Albert Schweitzer. And we know of Schweitzer because of his uh, career as a musician, as a superb organist, and also as, uh, as a missionary, one of the most famous missionaries of all time. But he was, first of all, a, an academic uh, person, a scholar of the highest order, and his book uh, was translated into English under the title, The Quest for the Historical Jesus. And what Schweitzer did was he analyzed and critiqued the whole drift of this evolutionary thought and revision of the New Testament concept of the kingdom of God that had become popular in 19th century liberalism. And Schweitzer himself was very much influenced by another scholar by the name of Johannes Weiss, or Wise, we would say, but it's Weiss in, in German. <coughs> And Weiss had, had argued, and had argued convincingly, that if we're going to take the New Testament documents seriously and the teaching of Jesus and the apostles seriously, we have to understand the teaching of the kingdom of God against a Jewish background of apocalyptic eschatology. Now, that sounds a little bit fancy. but. Uh, what basically Schweitzer was saying was that the message of Jesus and his teaching about the kingdom is unintelligible apart from the central focus 
of eschatology in it. <coughs> now, when Schweitzer talked about Jesus' eschatological view of the kingdom of God, he did not mean by the term eschatological what is normally simply meant by the term. Usually we use the term eschatological or eschatology simply to refer to the last things or the last times or the end times, a future orientation. But when Schweitzer talked about an eschatological kingdom, he meant a kingdom that comes not by a gradual, evolutionary, this-worldly, progressive development of ethics and so on, as the 19th century liberals were wont to describe it, but that this kingdom that Jesus spoke about that was coming would come catastrophically, suddenly, supernaturally, coming transcendentally from above, that the kingdom was something that God would bring from heaven, intruding into the normal process and progress of history. Now, understand this technical point. Schweitzer is saying, to try to interpret Jesus' teaching of the kingdom of God and his future prophecies the way the 19th century liberals were doing, were doing was fundamentally not only incorrect but dishonest, not really dealing with the plain teaching of the text of Scripture. For Schweitzer, for the New Testament documents to be intelligible, you must take seriously their eschatological framework. Now, it sounds at this point like Albert Schweitzer was fighting for the angels and was a fierce defender of, of Christian orthodoxy. On the contrary, all he's saying at this point is, if we're going to be faithful in our academic understanding of what the New Testament is saying, we have to read it as it was written, namely, in its eschatological language and expectation. And he said, there's no doubt from the record that Jesus' view of the kingdom of God was one that would come from heaven catastrophically. And there were different points in Jesus' ministry where Jesus, according to Schweitzer, expected the breakthrough of that kingdom from heaven. According to Schweitzer, first, for example, when Jesus sent his 70 out, to the various villages and towns of Israel announcing the kingdom of God, he expected that God would act and bring the kingdom to pass at that time. But it didn't happen. And so in Jesus' own consciousness, Jesus had to go through certain periods of delayed anticipation in his own consciousness. So that, for example, when he came to Jerusalem in the crisis moment of the triumphal entry, perhaps now God was going to bring the kingdom. Still didn't happen. But Jesus persisted with his expectation to the very end, even to allowing himself to be arrested, to be convicted, and you remember he spoke about, you know, you can't do this except I let you do it. I can call on legions of angels and they could save me, but he doesn't do it. He waits for God to intervene and intercede and to bring the kingdom. But finally, in his last moments on the cross, Jesus realizes it's not going to happen. And he cries out from the depths of his own agony and disillusionment, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Jesus dies as a noble figure, as a great teacher who embodied the gospel of love, which Schweitzer sought to, uh, to preach around the world, but he died in disillusionment about his own expectation of the coming 
of the kingdom of God. Now, the value of Schweitzer is, of course, since Schweitzer's work, it's been next to impossible for serious scholars to treat the teaching of the New Testament and the teaching of Jesus and not realize that it is couched constantly in eschatological language. That's the contribution Schweitzer has made to this crisis. Of course, his, the downside is, though he argues for the eschatological centrality of Jesus' teaching, of course, Jesus was wrong and he ended in disillusionment. Then he speaks of what is called in academic parlance the parousia delay. That not only did Jesus have to delay his expectation of his coming and the manifestation of his glory, but the early church had to go through this same process of parousia for trog or, or delay, so that as time passed, the church had to make all kinds of adjustments to allow not only for the failure of the kingdom to come in Jesus' lifetime, but then the failure of Jesus to return in their lifetime. Which brings us now again to this question that we uh, set forth in our first lecture about the time frame references of the coming glory of Jesus. Now, not everybody rolled over and played dead with the uh, negative uh, conclusions of Schweitzer. Uh, scholars uh, came and tried to speak to this concept of this Perusia delay, and one of the most important was a British scholar by the name of C. H. Dodd. <coughs> who wrote on the Gospel of John and, and on the parables of Jesus, which are uh, focused on Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God. You know in the parables he'll say the kingdom of God is like unto this, the kingdom of God is like unto that, and so on. C.H. Dodd is important for developing uh, what was called realized eschatology. where Dodd sees that, for the most part, the predictions of Jesus Dodd takes to have reference to a time frame of the first century. And he assumes that we have to take seriously those time frame references of the nearness of the coming of Jesus, but he concluded that Jesus was not disillusioned and that these time frame references did not fail to materialize, but in fact, the future forecasts of Jesus did take place in the framework in which He said they would, but in a spiritual sense. For example, we go back to those uh, three texts that were so problematic. You won't go all over all of the cities of Israel until uh, you see the Son of Man coming in power? Well, the disciples did see the Son of Man uh, being manifested, the kingdom of God being manifested, because in the New Testament the, uh, there are clear references to the presence of the kingdom of God. When John comes, John says the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus appears, He says the kingdom of God is in your midst. Jesus said, if you see me casting out Satan by the finger of God, then you know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. So that the very presence of Jesus was a manifestation and a coming of the Son of Man in His kingdom. Not only that, some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in power. He says that was a reference to an event that took place within just a couple of weeks or so, namely the Transfiguration, where some who were there were eyewitnesses of the glorious appearance of Jesus. Or in resurrection and ascension, in both resurrection and ascension, the glory of Jesus was made manifest to His disciples. And all of these things took place within the framework of that generation. 
So for Dodd, there was a completely realized future eschatology and that the prophecies that Jesus made were not about some future event at the end of the age, but had to do with the spiritual manifestation that actually took place in the first century. Now, uh, two other men who contributed to these discussions significantly were Oscar Kuhlmann and Hermann Ritterboss, the Dutch New Testament scholar. Kuhlmann developed a theory that was called the D-Day analogy that uh, had quite a lot of, uh, uh, of adherence uh, in, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, well, actually shortly after World War II, where he talked about the analogy or the relationship between D-Day, uh, the Allied invasion of Normandy that took place in June of 1944, uh, many months before the capitulation of Germany, uh, the war wasn't over until the following spring of 1945, but the turning point of the war was D-Day. And according to Kuhlmann, he said this, that just as D-Day signaled the end of the conflict of World War II, for all intents and purposes, the war was over by June of 1944 even though it didn't come to its actual conclusion until, what, April or May of 45. He said, so likewise, the future kingdom of what Jesus predicted decisively came to pass already with His earthly ministry, with His uh, resurrection, and with His ascension. And that the only thing left is kind of a postscript at the end of the age. But for all intents and purposes, the kingdom has come in power and glory, and the rest is just the uh, icing on the cake. But again, the question with this that immediately comes to the fore is, can you expect the end of the war to be 2,000 years after D-Day? That's where the analogy breaks down. Herman Ritterboss takes a similar position and he developed the concept in Dutch of what's called the alls and the noch niet, or the already and the not yet, in which he says if we're going to understand the New Testament, we have to see that the kingdom of God has already come in large measure. There is an alls to the kingdom of God, an already, but yet there still remains at the end of time, the final consummation of that kingdom, which has, not, which has come not yet, noch nicht. And so uh, tied with this is often the theory of primary and secondary fulfillment, namely that much of the pre preaching and teaching of the New Testament was fulfilled in its primary sense in, in biblical times though it will have a secondary fulfillment at the end of the age. These are some of the different ways in which people have been approaching the question of the time frame references. Dispensationalism, by the way, sees it all in the future. And uh, we're going to be looking at a position uh, that incorporates various elements of these approaches, and we'll begin that analysis in our next session.